but uh, supplemental protein feeding, which is your soy, flour, and different types of uh, formulations, sometimes uh, we put patties out and they're there for a month. They get hard, the bees don't eat them, and we just wasted uh, a pound of uh, pollen supplement. So, uh, anyway, we propose to find phagostimulants, stimulants, which will get them to uh, increase the, uh, the uh, consumption of, of these pollen patties and hopefully get more protein and, and other uh, nutrients into the, uh, into the colonies. And these are some of the uh, tests that we've conducted in the past in feeding studies. And this is in California. That's an avocado orchard. And uh, it's also in California. Uh, we conducted several tests. And of course, here, what, we're, uh, what I'm trying to show here is that feeding does, even if you have mites, it, you still have more bees you know, at, at the end of our, our trial here, which took about three months. So if you have high mites, you're gonna, you won't uh, get more bees. That's the bottom line there. And also, uh, the brood nest, you get, you get more brood produced if you have low mites and you feed the diet. Uh, when you have high mites and you do not feed a diet, you do not get very much brood. So that stands to reason. We've proven it. So, <clears throat> seal brood, same thing. Uh, and then this is the, the goal of getting six frame colonies to take to California for pollination. So, and feeding and having low mites. So that also goes to show that controlling varroa is very essential in, in the fall before uh, uh, going to California or going uh, for all the pollination. And of course they consume more diet if they're healthier, have low mites. If they have high mites, it doesn't seem like they consume as much. And maybe that's where we see the uh, hard uh, pollen patties and uh, you know we'll have we'll have to scrape that off and throw it away which is a waste <clears throat> and also in the weight of the emerge, newly emerged bees uh, it also shows that low mites and feeding diet uh, you, you get higher weights than you do, would if you know you didn't, didn't feed and this the timing of your feeding also uh, is very important we started feeding a group of bees in September, another in October, another in November. And as you can see, you can see the positive change in the ones started feeding in October. Of course, you have to weigh the cost uh, versus the, the number of bees that you're going to have before all the pollination. And the not fed, of course, we had a negative uh, number of change, neg negative number of bees. <coughs> but the later you start feeding, uh, the less of a change you're going to have. How often was it fed? Sir? How often was it fed? Uh, every two weeks, was it? Yeah. Every two weeks. One pound? One pound. And feeding pollen or protein in early September is better than feeding late in January. And providing protein any time before pollination is better than no feeding at all. And cold winter temperatures don't uh, prevent bees from eating even be pro with 4% pollen. So, <clears throat> and also these colonies started with low levels of protein, and but they increased during that time. And, you know, everything is positive here. It, and it didn't increase the varroa. The only thing we noticed when we were feeding, if you have small hive beetles, and I think the beetles like the pollen patties. So we have to keep a check on, on small hive beetles. <coughs> And, of course, you all seen bees being transported or loaded. And this is what it looks like in California when we were out there. And it's just very impressive. Now, th this is a test we conducted in Louisiana. These bees had just arrived from, uh, from uh, New York, upstate New York. And they were in a holding yard. And we had to select the colonies we were going to use for our test. And of course, we're working at night in the muck and mud, loading colonies for our test. We do work uh, late hours sometimes. And 
this just shows you uh, some of the bees used for our test, and this is kind of kind of an impressive test for even for researchers. Uh, we used 400 colonies for one test, so uh, I think Frank will speak on this later on. But uh, and there's part of the crew. I think Henry was taking the picture. <coughs> And then we uh, set out the bees in 50 hives per treatment group. So is fat an indicator of bee health? That was the question. Uh, and of course, lipids are composed of fatty acids. And some of these have been shown to have antimicrobial uh, properties. And they also play a role in the hygiene of the colony. But they are essential in the nutrition. The other factor we're looking at, are they also phagostimulant? Do they stimulate the bees to eat more if there's a higher percentage of one fatty acid as opposed to others? <clears throat> and of course, uh, stored fat in humans, uh, your doctor will tell you, you better lose weight. But we do want fat honeybees. We do want bees to store more fat so they'll be healthier. And also, uh, you know, they, they also uh, produce more uh, offspring or more uh, more brood, and this is uh, s this is just a small fraction of the uh, results. Uh, th this is the fat portion of that test that, that I we were talking about. Oops! Did I goof it up? had less than 2.4 milligrams of fat. <laughs> if I have to move forward. I'll let you do the 40. Yeah, I can do it here. Okay. If you had uh, uh, less than 2.4 milligrams of fat, that was our cutoff point. You had the lower production of, uh, of frame, six frame bee colonies. And if you had more fat in the bees, they, they produced more bees. So you had greater uh, success in producing six frame colonies. And the same goes for protein. And we, we set a level of less than 25 uh, milligrams of protein, you'd have fewer bees. and if you had more than 25 milligrams of protein in our samples, we, we could produce more six frame colonies in January. Uh, we monitored fat per bee during 14 months of this test. And we started off with the bees that came in from New York in October of 2009. And we started feeding and some of these took off and <coughs> they had more fat in January and February and they started tapering off and then they went to almost nothing in December of the following year. And I can't explain that one. So uh, the fat we did uh, uh, with gas chromatography, the GC that you see there, uh, and we had to do some chemical manipulation to get our fat to be uh, visible in our chromatograph. So it, it takes a little bit of chemistry to, to do. And uh, well, we, of course, we developed the methods. We're investigating uh, fatty acid profiles of whole body honeybee samples. <coughs> uh, and uh, we've uh, identified 19 fatty acids of interest in the honeybee bodies. And this is a, a, a this is my lab, and we have a gas chromatograph, a liquid chromatograph, which we use for analyses. And we want to understand uh, what is going on in the bee body, which is physiology, of course, and uh, the effects of supplementary feeding on winter growth. And we can see that by our some of our data. But we also want to understand what's going on inside the bee body the oxidative stress on, on the bee colonies and the possible nutritional needs. <clears throat> and
And this is just a sample of, of the total fat in honeybees. And if we were feeding, uh, we get more total fat in January than we did at the start. And this is just a preview of all the, uh, the fatty acids that are found in the honeybees. But if you look in this area here, this is percentages 8, 41, 15, 12. This is where you find a lot of the fatty acids in the C18 or the, uh, the uh, linoleic, linolinic, and the oleic acids. So we, are, we think that they may have a, they play a role in, in the uh, nutrition of the honeybee. And this group has been reported to be similar to other insect attractants, so that also piqued our interest, since we're trying to get the bees to eat more uh, of the pollen supplement. So that's one of the goals that we're trying to, to reach, is to get the bees to eat more of the pollen supplement by finding some of these chemical components. Of course, the almond pollen comes off the almond flowers, and here we have a mixture of all kinds of Texas brush, mesquite, and other wild plants. <coughs> the extractable molecules uh, and oils uh, obtained from pollen, are, we're studying. We're stu studying both the molecules that come off the plant as an odor, and also the stuff we can extract with the uh, solvent. So we're going at it from two different uh, sides and trying to see if we can find something that will stimulate the bees to, to eat. So our goal is to identify phagostimulants, which phagostimulant is um, a compound that will uh, stimulate the bees to eat. And we're going trying to identify what is found in almond pollen versus South Texas pollen, and maybe later on other pollens that we may be purchasing to include in our diets. <coughs>
And we've noticed a difference between South Texas pollen or Chinese pollen and almond pollen. They really go for almond pollen. There must be something in there that uh, piques their curiosity or they can sniff and they're really jumping on it and eating, uh, eating it really, really fast. And here's a picture of, or a chromatogram. This is what comes out of the instrumentation that we have. And this is the South Texas pollen. As you can notice, there's lots of peaks, and each peak uh, indicates a <coughs> chemical compound. And it's separated in, uh, in that volatile sample. This is almond pollen. You notice it has a few less peaks than the other one. Uh, the, see, there's the Texas pollen, and there's the almond pollen. <coughs> so we're trying to decipher what these chemicals are and what cues they give the bees uh, so they can feed. Okay, so we, I'm still working on this. We, we have preliminary findings that almond pollen in South Texas ranch country have different chemical odors or chemical patterns and they have different chemicals in them. <coughs> uh, so we will try to isolate and identify individual, individual odors and add them back individually to our pollen substitute uh, to see if the bees will, will take it more readily. And then going back to the uh, fatty acids, we're gonna try and hopefully make it more nutritious, not only more uh, more appetizing for the for the honeybees. So we're proposing to conduct laboratory and field tests for consumption, palatability, and ultimately bee health and having more bees. Thank you all. <coughs>